Mike Check 1 2. Welcome back to the Agassino Zinger Show, episode number 488. With me, your host, Agassino Zinger. This is episode number 488. How you doing? How you feeling? Fantastic, amazing. If it's the first time watching the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash that like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. And if you're watching the show or listening, actually, and more to it via the podcast app, please leave me a five star review and share the show with your friends. Five star reviews won't take you any longer than a couple of seconds to do, but you know, it will help spread the show, get it up on that list organically, and all that malarkey. I don't really know exactly what it does, but I know it helps in terms of shirt stability. If I'm not too sure, if I'm not too um, uh, incorrect in that regard, if you leave reviews, people when they search my show, it will come up in the first listings. Obviously, it should come up in listings because my name's a bit weird, but still, any help, any push would be much appreciated. So, if you can leave me a five star review, on itunes i'll be much appreciated and i'll thank you forever as i'm doing right now and of course support via patrons welcome to patreon bonus content coming out at the end of this week I'm going to two raves so i'm going to be um reviewing the nights out and recording some you know field recording sort of stuff that i promised i'd do last time i'm going to do it for this one because this is a bit more interesting of a venue that i'm going to and people i'm seeing going to see todd turge and good jansen on the friday and saturday so if you're not subscribed on the patreon already make sure you get on there now don't don't delay patreon.com for just agostino for all the inside detailed goss on that regard so make sure you join get involved don't delay get involved on there today you can find a link in the description it's patreon.com for just agostino patreon.com my first name you can find it in the descriptions don't delay join and get involved today but yeah what's the vibe man what's, what's crack lacking hope you're good wherever you are it's now what sometime wednesday evening i'm just about to try and adjust this cam so it doesn't chop off too much on my head I've been desperately trying to get a haircut and it seems like every other place that I've been going to is um un unable to trim my bonnet. So now I'm in this weird purgatory state where I'm thinking, should I just shave so I can open my face up? Or should I wait until a, a professional can, you know, apply his flipping sheep um, shearers to my bonnet? I don't really know. But probably I'm going to wait, obviously, but it's just the in-between stage is annoying. I really wish I could do those self-cutting system i wish i could be one of those self-cutting system dudes you know stand in front of a mirror and give myself like um, an amazing odor beckham shit fade but i tried i think this is a few years ago maybe three or four years ago i tried to do the whole like cutting my own hair at home thing and it was all right but you know it wasn't the best it kind of looked like i'd um you know fell over and tripped no it, could, it, felt, it looked like i tripped up and fell into one of those um lawnmower cutters you know those little things that they used to cut off just the top but that's what it looks like like it's bare patchy it didn't really work I, I usually was okay with the sides obviously if you're right-handed you know this side's gonna be easier than that side um or no right side's gonna be easier than the left side but then when it gets to the back it's just a complete different situation and also when you're going to a barber's you just assume well, no just assume because you're sat in this chair and you're seeing this person do this sort of like repetition this sort of like thing that they do when they cut your hair they maybe line it up they shave away some of the bottom bits um they they kind of maybe level off some of the sides they might do the corners first whatever they do right they've got steps everyone's got a step that they do and there's usually you know every barber has their own sort of steps they do so usually methodical it doesn't really change per the person or even the haircut because in general they're still fading your hair so when you see that you can be led to believe that it's a lot easier than what it looks like and you just think okay if i just cut this line it, it'll be done but it's not as easy as that it takes a lot more skill to do so which is why people are professional barbers you know what i mean that exists people go to championships and stuff and show off their talents and how they can fade and color and trim and that it's a big deal so to for me to think i could just learn it via my eye is just insane but it does go it does go to it is quite similar to what's happening with um you know people when it comes to like fighting and running i think it's a similar sort of thing i think people just assume you know because they have legs they can run right like really well which you can't i've, I've kind of noticed it now having to get back into doing long distance running after taking you know more than a year off it's a flipping slog and i'm running slower than i've ever run in my entire life but you know it counts trying to get out there but just because you have legs you think you can run well and just because you have hands or whatever or arms you think you can fight too it's just a weird thing that humans have and i think just because you see somebody cutting your hair so often you just assume it's easy and maybe because there's a little 
deep down there's a little bit of resentment in you i know there was with me where you're thinking i shouldn't really be paying you 20 pounds i shouldn't really be paying you a tenner or 30 or however much you pay you you, you kind of feel like you're not worth it when they are really worth it right because they're taking the stress and the worry out of the haircut because you can never do it correct yourself so they do it for you but you're still thinking in the back of your head that, mm, I could do this myself better. I could do this myself better. And you try and, you know, you, you quite quickly realize that you can't. <laughs> That's the good thing as well about running, fighting and haircuts. There's no, um, there's no faking the funk. It's either you've got a good trim or you haven't. It's either you can fight or you can't. It's either you're fast or you're not. It's either you can run or you can or you can't. There's no in between. Those are some of the um, thinkings I've been having over the last few days. And again, this has only come about because I have been unable to get my own trim. So I'm like, oh, this is so annoying. But you know, say la vie and all that, innit? You have to kind of um, take the rough with a smooth, and hopefully I'll get it whenever I can get it. But you know, if 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 all else fails, I'm gonna have to go to one of those crazy hood ones i have at the moment that's like you know it looks like a flipping trap house but they 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 can cut your head yeah i mean they can they can get you looking semi right so maybe i'll do that maybe i'll do that anyway loads of stuff to talk about loads of interesting topics to dig into so if you've not already got yourself situated and settled then please do and let's dive on deep so first thing i want to notice i want to kind of point out and read i kind of spoke about this briefly in another episode but i just want to touch on this again this whole rich twitch streamer thing right happening with this guy called um hassan b i suppose his name or hassan pike i guess he's related to or kind of associated with the guys over at um young turks i think whoever runs it is his uncle or dad or whatever i don't really know but regardless right so if you're not familiar this hassan pike dude who i'm going to put on screen the guy there on the right with the glasses um he was re recently revealed i don't know why in america's like this but i guess because you have to i guess it's because of different states and stuff i don't know how exactly it works or why when you buy a house in america and you're somebody of notoriety people automatically find out where you bought it i guess because you have to put your name against it i don't know it's just odd everyone always finds out what people house looks like in america they know what everyone's house looks like they know your address of course some of them most of them won't be able to get there because most people live in the hidden hills which are sort of like basically in the hidden hills there's a gate you have to go through in order to kind of even get up the hill so you know 24 hour security and all that malarkey so it prevents you know strangers from just rocking up and taking pictures outside brad pitt's home but still for some odd reason whatever has unpack a bought a house in la for like 2.75 million or next to 3 million and the internet found out about it and of course him being a ardent socialist it just seemed insane that somebody that you know continually wears eat the rich shirts would be happily happy to spend 2.7 mil on a house right no one's saying you should live in squalor no one's saying that but if you're gonna live the life live the life in it like that's where you kind of have to give that girl what's her name man that scandinavian little white girl that goes around looking like she hasn't eaten in days right she's always taking flipping trains everywhere right she doesn't take a plane she's not want to increase her carbon footprint you know some of it might be virtue signaling some of it might be posturing but still she backs her talk i mean she walks the walk she's about the environment and she tries her best um within her means to make sure that she's not you know um damaging um the environment or you know going against her moral standpoint or her ethics of worldviews her ideals whatever it may be it's not much but you try right you try to do something so it just interesting just for me again i don't know these people too tough but it's just an interesting kind of um it's just an interesting uh it must be an interesting sort of place to be in when you have this real strong position that kind of everyone knows you for and then you do something that kind of in theory goes against everything that you actually stand for right because obviously again no one's saying she live in squalor but spending 2.75 whatever million it is to live in la to live in the hidden hills right it sounds pretty insane yeah okay? it doesn't sound like something a socialist would do um and also to do it unironically to do it without you know kind of acknowledging your um you know just acknowledging your hypocrisy that's the one thing yeah that's what i was thinking just the lack of acknowledgement of hypocrisy is what really drives me insane i don't really understand these people because i just i get just doing stuff and just not giving a fuck right because i think that's more admirable just kind of buying you know a gold-plated bugatti 
right um an ap watch that only one person one other person has and that person's dead you know those kind of stuff like yeah do that enjoy yourself i think that's far more admirable but when you try and appease people and pretend like you're not as wealthy as you are try and come across as the every man and then as soon as you have to make like big fine big kind of like um, life decisions things that other people probably don't can't afford to just you know drop a couple of grand or a couple of mil on to kind of do whatever they do whether it's kind of healthcare, whether it's oh my car's broken down i have to get a replacement you know little things that you get an indication of where somebody is like on the socioeconomic level right like well how did you you know what i mean so soon you know you needed a break and then suddenly you're seeing pictures of this guy out there in car food or something right it's just madness so that's why i just think it would be nice to see these people i think the other lady is that boomer girl one yeah that nicole nicolou whatever right um is it bernie bernie girl boom i don't know wherever that girl is right all the all the little um twitter kids were getting um were kind of wanking profusely over and then they started hating her because she bought like a flipping bmw but that aside it would be nice to see some of these people just kind of let their nuts hang and just say hey yes i know i'm an ardent socialist but i'm also a raging hypocrite and we all are so yes i'm going to try and fight for the poor quote unquote and i want to tax the rich cool or eat the rich yeah and i've got this flipping anarchist tattoo on my back or on my or a chain or you know the, the a hanging off a pendant somewhere but i sometimes do things that go against everything i stand for because humans do that all the time right we are all hypocritical in our own walks of life and i guess these guys aren't that different but still it's it's a lol 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 incident so this is an article courtesy of dextero it says is that how you said it right dex dexero dexerto oh no dexerto which it says here um headline says when twitch streamers become rich why are fans outraged it says has Piker bought a home worth three million in hollywood hills so in west hollywood not hollywood hills i'll take it back the twitch streaming superstar has accumulated a massive following on the platform and this pays handsomely but for some reason outrage has ensued and it's not the first time fans of Aaron good by the streamer spending money early in 2021 100 thieves member nikolai faced the, um, the brunt of the internet when she purchased a similarly priced apartment both hassan and nikolai have been criticized and shamed for their buying their homes and money they earned making content streaming I don't have a again i don't think anyone should have a problem with these people making money online i think the great thing about oops for these police officers the great thing about um streaming online and the great thing about the internet is that by and large if people like your content and like what you do they will support you whether it's through donations tipping or subbing um going linking to your patreon buying your merch right and usually for the most part most of these people aren't being you know they're not they don't have a gun placed aside of their head and being forced into watching your content they're doing it because they like what you do regardless of what other people think they like what you do cool you play to your crowd no problem they're happy to see you get wealthy because they're you know monetarily supporting you in any way which they can it's just the political and social stances that they take or you know kind of let's say the activism things that they do um and then they their kind of monetary decisions or monetary purchases kind of go against everything they stand for on paper again no one's saying she lives in squalor but there is something funny about somebody that was talking about, you know, that was propping up Bernie and his brand of socialism. And then suddenly you buy a $2 million apartment in the heart of New York, I think, or wherever it is. And the same goes for Hassan Piker. Just, it's just hilarious to me. And I, and I just don't know why they don't, they don't see the hilarity of it and can't just poke fun at themselves and be like, you know what? Like I said, I'm hypocritical. And just move on. It's all good. You know, she kind of turned off her comments, got angry, turned off the likes and shit, was threatening to take it down. It's just like, what are you doing? Do you know what I mean? I just, I don't know. It is what it is. Who, no one's going to take the house off you anyway. It's just like, I don't know. It's just ridiculous. It continues. It says here, there is a political angle, of course. Both streamers are espoused socialist views in the past. And so some argue that their hypocrisy is now being rich. But that's not the whole story. After all, Hassan's been far from one of the most watched streamers for almost two years. He's been wealthy for that entire time. So why the hate now? Really, the issue is the nature of the parasocial relationship of when fans suddenly realize that their streamers are not the guy next door that they thought they are. I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true. I think usually streamers lose their audiences when people realize that the persona that they have on stream doesn't actually match with how they actually are in real life, like for better or worse. It's less so about the fact that they get rich. I don't think so. I think, you know, weirdly enough, your fans are kind of like, they're sort of like pay pigs in the kind of DSP sense of the word. They want to see you ascertain wealth. They want to see you become more successful. They, they're they happy when you get more subs. You know what I mean? They're, they're looking to boost you up. They want to tell your friends about you. They just don't like it when streamers, you know, turn into dicks, right? Ethan Klein being a good one. H3, he's not a streamer, but he's a content creator. He's a good one 
one where people thought the persona that they got in all those you know original history H production videos was completely different to how he is you know in real life because you get to see how he's like in real life and how he thinks how he speaks via the podcast and people just were like put off obviously the ones that stayed i'm um, fans but for the most part people kind of ducked away because they're like Ugh. same with you know philly defranco the more he started inserting himself into the news and started to be irate or annoyed at stuff that he should be irate, irate about because you know this is his own personal stance the moment people started to not like him as a person because they thought you know what we don't like this person because we we are we were in love with the persona but the person doesn't match up with who we love and that's okay but i don't think it's to do with money it continues says the appeal streamers is often just that viewers feel like they can relate to a streamer either because they look like them um share the same views or play the game uh, or play the same game as them this leads to a common problem with parasocial relationships an issue prominently raised by ludwig another streamer with millions of followers who blew up from humble beginnings in a now viral video ludwig, ludwig made it clear and said i'm not your friend the message that went a oh, while wow. is is that while a viewer might spend hours um with their favorite streamer the streamer spends absolutely no time whatsoever with the viewer well she must get rich inevitably massive popularity and stretch comes with a momentary gain as it should some may write off the challenges of full-time streamer just as playing games or living but there's a lot of work behind the scenes that for most fans will consider of course it's also a very enviable job but it's a job nonetheless the problem occurs when the streamer was once deemed so relatable leaves their squat apartment for a multi-million dollar home at this point the viewer's perception of their favorite streamer challenge hassan's case is unique in that his content is very political but this same theory applies to content creators ninja just another example in this case he immediately attracted more haters than ever after moving home um fe featuring on a late night talk show and appearing in nfl commercials uh nick uh, look at him he's he, he's now so he's now associating bright look at this is a tweet from hassan he's saying bright bar and left with and left twitter weirdos are shaking their hands in agreement with socialism is when you'd have no house it's like Poor interpretation of the criticism. No one's saying you shouldn't have a home, mate. You know what I mean? People just think it's funny that you wear a eat the rich shirt or tax the rich shirt and you are essentially buying a $3 million home in West Hollywood. It's just insane. It's what, basically a mansion. All right? It's just really funny. Um, the, the hypocrisy of it is dripping. It's, you know, um, and it continues to say Nikolai was, was a brunt of the joke almost a month after revealing a new pad. There was a collective notion of surprise as though people were blissfully unaware that being popular stream would lead to increased earnings. With so many ways of making money as a content streamer, um, sponsorship and revenue, subscription, merch, and exclusive content, the days of a relatable bedroom streamer on Twitch are becoming a thing of the past. One streamer who is perhaps acutely aware of this is Felix, uh, by far the most watched individual streamer on Twitch. Felix keeps his setup very low key. His background is very uncluttered. His room is small and he rarely, if ever, shows off any of his purges. Despite this, his viewers are more than aware of how much um, a person's popularity will be bringing in each month. But um, Felix is careful not to make a focal point of his content. His famous six console rank exemplifies this. Yeah, true. He's like the opposite of like DSP in it, right? This Felix guy, right? He, he doesn't make money the, the main kind of theme of his streams. Uh, he purposely tries to avoid showing any kind of you know even indicating where he's at financially and just streams even though he's you know probably earning let's say a hundred grand a month or something stupid like that whereas phil our friend dsp is out here begging for tips every day what an insane world but yeah i don't know moving for that one and it's boring but yeah you know what i mean I, I think these guys just need to embrace the hill in them i think they all want to be loved and adored and then unfortunately when you're filthy rich it's very difficult to be loved and adored look at joe rogan he doesn't really do anything to anybody. He's not really in a position to put anything. He's not really in a position to like change anything, you know, in government, in a, anyone's everyday life. But still people get absolutely deranged at some of the things that he says and get really angry because he's essentially really wealthy, isn't it? That's basically it. Once you get ascertained a lot of wealth and you have the ear of a lot of people, people get really worried that you might, I don't know, become the next Mussolini or something. It's just a bizarre world we live in, but what can you do about that in it then moving on we have another um indication of today's pop stars are just happy to court attention and just be you know basically living embodiments of attention seekers as opposed to trying to create viral moments off the back of their music and their craft and demi lovato is no 
bigger example of that bigger in all pun intended so it says curse your buzzfeed it says demi lovato says she you know says day see i missed i what you call it what's that what's the word called um not misgendered whatever that word is um demi lovato says they may not always identify as non-binary as they continue their gender journey right i misgendered her sorry my bad i misgendered they actually that's it my bad i remember being outside of um what was it what was that place called it might have been in the yard and getting into a really and this again i was you know flying high i was high as a kite drunk as a kite talking to a couple of randoms outside in the smoking area where they have all the benches and seats and i guess i misgendered one or two um of them i guess so is that how you'd say it and now at that time i wasn't aware of all this stuff i really wasn't gender pronouns i had no idea what they were i think i might have heard it on the podcast, but i didn't really i hadn't really seen it in action in irl and they were sincere enough or you know nice enough about it in terms of correcting me and informing me what was going on but for real there was like a good five to ten minute period where i was just like i didn't understand like why would you call yourself day if you're i'm just talking to you it's a thing that that's not a singular jamie you know I, mean? I, I couldn't wrap my head around it until it kind of clicks like, oh yeah now I get what you're talking about it just didn't function in real life conversations and if anything it made the conversations clunky and it made it just awkward because my naivety and my kind of um bemusement made it seem as if i was being dismissive or being rude of you know the, the way that they choose to live their life or the way that they choose to identify which i wasn't i was just generally confused because again i was high and drunk and also i didn't understand what was going on it was just like it just didn't make any sense but again they were nice enough to explain it to me but i felt bad afterwards because it felt like i came across like a dick right i was purposely not trying to understand and trying to be edgy or whatever it's just not the case and these are real life people, which I mean, real life kids, people, you know, who are not famous or just kind of chilling and doing their thing. Cool. No problem. It's just a little bit, I wouldn't say it feels disingenuous, but it does feel a little bit opportunistic when you see pop stars with all the access, money, connections and whatever in the world when they come out and try to attach themselves to stuff like this in order to, I guess, associate themselves with a subset of people who are going through some, you know, interest, who are going through an interesting journey in life trying to get you know get all these gender pronouns to become part of the you know general lexicon is going to be a real slog but they're trying they're doing their best some of it's a bit corny and a bit naff but again you have to try so they're doing that so they launch themselves next to that and they're not really bringing anything to the table it feels like like who are they really helping you know what i mean like what barriers are they really breaking down if anything it's just another way to call attention it's just another little trinket to add to your little um, you know, when somebody introduces somebody on stage and says, oh, this person has, you know, 35 Grammys, two Emmys and all that stuff. When you add these kind of, you know, um, gender pronouns to your name, especially if you're, again, for a pop star more so, I just, I always look at it with a side eye because it just adds to your ability to kind of garner attention and get people to talk about you, right? I will make you seem more interesting than you actually are. Especially for somebody like Demi Lovato, again, who I say is immensely talented, has an amazing voice. Whether you know you like her songs or not, she can sing. Like for a white girl, she can sing, 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 right? And still, still, the music is not up to par. There is no music really. It's like a lizard thing. It's just all outrage marketing it's nothing else but outrage like what is this really doing like what is this serving who needs to know and even again even if you're going through this journey your pop side does anybody need to know this does this add anything to what you're doing um does it actually make you more interesting probably not i would argue that you don't even need to be interesting to be a pop star you just need to make good records you might need to have a couple of moments to kind of you know get your google trends popping off and stuff and get you popping on all the main music blog pages on instagram but these days, to be a pop star, do you really need to have all these antics? I don't necessarily think you do. I think if you make a really generic middle-of-the-road tune that plays on radio that people seem to love, they'll just pop that shit all day long without all the antics, I personally think. But what do I know? It says here, the article, because your BuzzFeed, the musician who came out as non-binary back in May recently spoke out about their experience exploring their gender and what the future looks like for them um being non-binary what that means is that i'm so much more than non-binary of a man and a woman and that we are um all so much more if we allow ourselves the ability to look within ourselves and challenge the, the binary that we grew up and living in do people need to tell some of these celebrities like most people aren't really looking to look inwards most people are checking their bank accounts and making sure that they have enough money to pay the electric bill most people are making sure that they have enough pence in their account to make sure that they can buy some bread 
right? They're worried that their schools, that their kids are going to get bullied in school because they don't have the correct school uniform and having to buy blanks and Primark and stuff because they can't afford the official one with the badge on it. Most people are making sure that they can pay their phone bill so that the interviews that they're applying for, people can phone them back. Most people are trying to get out of bed without spraining or breaking something. Most people have had their families completely decimated through that COVID and stuff, right? Or through the lack of having jobs has kind of rendered relationships null and void, has broken up families, you know, destroyed people's interpersonal relationships in all manner of sizes. They don't have time to look inwards. This is a luxury only really afforded by people who live a somewhat privileged life, it feels like. Who else has time to do this? If you do have time to do it, it's cool. You just do it and you keep on trucking. It's not something that you kind of get BuzzFeed to write an article about you about you know it's just it just isn't you've got more better things to be worrying about and also if if anything you're you you're trying to use your platform whatever it is to basically um bring attention to people who don't have as much influence or access as you do in order for them to feel like they're not alone but all this what is this doing for anybody it's just self-serving it's just a self-serving tactic to get people to pay attention and this lady has been on the one non-stop everything Demi Lovato may be the only celebrity I've ever seen in my entire life who came out of rehab and got more hate. Usually, whenever celebrities go into rehab, regardless of who they are, right, however repugnant they may be, there's something about going to rehab and, you know, stripping stripping yourself bare, confessing to your sins, asking for forgiveness, and trying to live a better life that makes people, you know, that's indigenous of the people. People start to think, you know what, let's give he or she a chance, day a chance, right, because... Look what they've done. They've done something incredibly brave, right? They be, they've want to be vulnerable. They're, they're not pretending that they can handle everything. They've gone to seek some professional help. Maybe this is an indication that they're changing as a person. But Demi is the only person who went to rehab, came out, and people hate her more than ever. <laughs> it's just insane. They seem just they don't, maybe they don't hate her, but they just tolerate her. She's not loved. They're not. She, there's nothing endearing about her in that respect. Maybe because she's done it herself, and you know what she she tried to get a flipping froyo place shut down you know remember that story recently where she started ranting or raving because a place that she went into to buy frozen yogurt dared dare to sell yogurt that wasn't she i think she went in there specifically because they sold like um non-sugar non-sugar sort of variants of this yogurt um or non yeah right non-sugar versus of the yogurt and then when she went in there they dared to sell you know Variants that had sugar and were basically coated in hundreds of thousands and chocolate chips and stuff and got really angry and threatened to basically close the entire place down. Like, you know, it's just like wild shit. Ikatia says, they lay out it. I was very nervous in the beginning of coming out as non-binary because I didn't want people to think it was inauthentic. It is inauthentic. I'm telling you now, it's inauthentic. You just want attention. Your music sucks. You don't know how to properly write new records. No one really wants to work with you that's got any kind of talent because you're one you know, person sinking ship and uh, and a best way to kind of make sure people keep talking about you and you're in the press is to come out as non-binary. She says, yeah, I just want people to see what coming out as non-binary meant to my healing process. I just love if they just would just do something interesting. That's it, be interesting. Is it really that hard to be interesting or to just say something, um, to have a hot take that might kind of, you know push people's buttons a little bit on, on a current topic as opposed to something as safe as this it's just safe it's just meh do you know what I mean i don't know um demi Levar noted that they fight um they first began questioning the agendas early as elementary school but the entire gender journey will last forever <laughs> of course it does uh, there might be a time where identifies trans <laughs> where there might be a time where <laughs> identifies non-binary and gender non-conforming my entire life or maybe there's a period in time when i get older and identify as a woman bruv she wants everything she wants to eat her cake and eat it she wants it all she wants it all or they want it all they want it all everything give me everything give me every um every identifier that i can add to myself it's like one of those people that has a twitter bio and it's just like blm you know times up and you know stop asian hate and all this everything every single you know social media activist tweet hashtag they have on their bio gender you know rainbow flags everywhere it's like but who are you as a person cool all those labels are fun we get where you stand and what you you know what you kind of are passionate about but who are you at your core for real let's get to the core of that god damn it man these people but you know maybe it's a good thing maybe it's better she just does she does this instead of putting out music because the music's going to be terrible anyway so what's the point and you know there's nothing worse i'd imagine if you're an artist or a musician and you can make records from 
the ground up, right? Build it. Um, you can produce a track, produce an album to put it out and people completely hate it, right? In the space of an hour or sometimes less than. So maybe the pressure of trying to get to the level that they were at previously in terms of notoriety, number one hits or, you know, top 50 hits, top 10 hits, whatever on Billboard, it's just too much. So, and you don't want to go through that emotional hell of having to fight critics and whatnot, right? That are saying maybe you're past it, maybe it's over. That's going to eat away at you. So why not just do the second best thing and come out as non-binary and go from there? God damn it, these people, they have they have not they have no um they have no morals and then to make things interesting another update on this whole smelly celebrity gate thing that's been perplexing to see mostly american celebrities for the most part i've not really seen a lot of european or uk people come out and say that they don't shower or don't use deodorant it hasn't really been a thing but definitely these americans who want to seem edgy and weird and stuff i think i heard joey diaz mention it on his podcast something about um it's a standard trope or it's a standard little hack or trick that a lot of actors do where they purposely won't wash or bathe or whatever it may be or purposely look a little bit disheveled so that they can kind of stand out from the pack when they go into auditions um i guess it works for some people um but i guess for some other people if you have so imagine i guess if you if 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 the if you're my family mcconaughey and you go into audition most likely the people you're auditioning with are all killers as well right all supreme actors so that you're in the top one percent out so the only way to differentiate yourself would be to adopt these weird little kinks right or you don't shower for a week or you don't bath or you don't brush your teeth and you have that kind of gummy weird you know thing going on in your, in your mouth um you don't you know you don't kind of wipe away the crust in your eye and stuff like all that shit can add to it but this is just gross this is the headline courtesy of fox users it says lizzo joins matthew mcconaughey by making the decision to stop wearing deodorants the truth hurts singer claims she smells better after nixing deodorant from her hygiene routine i disagree there's no way i'm a I'm a bigger dude who's losing a bunch of weight, right? And I've I'm not, I've never been as big as Lizzo, don't get me wrong. But I'm generally a sweaty dude anyway, regardless of the weight. Even when I was at my skinniest, I was always sweating. Just something about my pores. So you can only imagine what I must look like when I'm on MD or on, or on a bloody pill. I'm just, you know, absolutely look like a psycho. So thank God those things are in my past. But in general, I'm a sweaty dude. And I know that I'm sweaty in general, but I'm sure my weight is what adds to the sweat. So there's no way Lizzo can tell me at the size that she's at, especially being a black lady, that she doesn't sweat much. Because I, I don't know what it is about our skin. Maybe it's because it's really oily and greasy or whatever. It holds moisture really well. We got, you know, black people can basically, you know, um, look really sweaty sometimes and then look really moisture. I don't know. Something about the way our skin works. I'm not sure what it is. Where sometimes, I think my brother's like that. Sometimes he can not be, you can just be not a sweaty person. Sometimes he can be a sweaty person. But usually you can tell who, you know, purse brace a lot and i just don't believe that someone like a lizard can get away with not wearing deodorant i wish i could be that person i remember bumping into a couple of people when i was backpacking or backpacking or traveling around nicaragua for a bit and i bumped into a few people in a couple of hostels who were doing those kind of crystal things right that you kind of run underneath a tap and you put under your armpit and look i wish that could work with for me i really do that would be amazing right to kind of do away with all these aerosol cans that you're spraying under your armpits that'd be great but they just don't work. You end up smelling in two seconds. It just is what it is. And th th I would much rather take the hit or spraying an aerosol under my, ca under my armpits than hoping that a crystal works and then going outside after I've showered and then people thinking I smell of B.O. and I haven't showered. You know what I mean? Like, no one wants that. The worst thing in the world is to be a very clean person and then have people think you're dirty because you forgot to put deodorant on right that's just not what you want especially if you you know look after your hygiene pretty well but yeah it says here the article lizzo's joined ranks of celebrities who don't follow basic hygiene rules a 33 year old musician revealed that she agrees with matthew mcconaughey when it comes to not wearing deodorant lizzo shared an article about the actor's decision to stop wearing deodorant and admitted she'd actually made the same decision she's a this is the big one of the biggest attention seekers next to lizzo next to flipping demi lovato in it the other day she's crying about people calling her fat um about but people weren't they're just saying that her song sucks right? that song rumor she got with cardi b just sounds terrible um this is somebody who actually likes her music it's just not good so all those years of antics and putting you know caught in attention online and trying to go viral and fact acceptance facts activism or acceptance thing that she's doing it didn't really work 
So she's just trying to drum up attention online. So one week is that, and then next week is this. It's like you can see the game that she's playing, and it? it is what it is, I guess. So she says the following. She says, and I quote, Okay, I'm with him on this. I stopped using deodorant and I smell better. Lizzo wrote on her Instagram story on Thursday. Connor Hay previously told People Magazine back in 2005 that he hadn't worn deodorant in 20 years. Actress Yvette Nicole Brown, who had a small role in Tropic Thunder, along Simon Connor recently revealed that her the actor doesn't have a smell despite not using deodorant. She says, I remember Matthew McConaughey said that he did not use deodorant and that he had not been, and he didn't not have an odor. Um, my first thought was, if I'm going to get as close as I can to him to see if that's right. He does not have an odor, she said. He smells like a granola and good living. That's all I can say. He was a sweet, sweet scent that is just him. It's not musty or crazy. Of course you say this. Matthew McConaughey, though. Who's going to come out and trash him and say he smells like a fucking skunk? No one's going to say that. It's just it's just funny to see another attention seeker latch on to the attention seeking subjects of the day and make themselves, you know, more popping on the social media feeds. But in general, it's just embarrassing. Why would you admit to something like this, too? It's just, I don't know. I don't know. People are happy to be smelly. Not for me, mate. It's just not for me. What else we have here? Oh, this is pretty mad, isn't it? I'm sure most of you have seen this. This this response to um, COVID all around Europe has been interesting. So this is courtesy of RA. It says 70 70,000 plus people support unmute RSA protests in Netherlands held in response to the recent banning of large scale events. The protests were accompanied by sound system and DJ sets. Um, Saturday saw unmute protests take place across Netherlands with around 70,000 people hitting the streets. Unmute US was formed in response to the Dutch government's banning of large scale events, including festivals, until lo at least October 31st. Protests were organized to demand that these events were. Per that these events were permitted from September 1st. Saturday's protest took place in Eidenhoven, Groningen, whatever that word is. It, says, it looks like nigger, um, Utrecht, Rotterdam, and Amsterdam. They soon began to resemble mini festivals themselves with large crowds gathering around sound systems or fallen DJs playing out um, the back of trucks as they moved through the city. Last time they did this in the London, it was mostly tech house people, right? It was all those kind of, you know, tea, techno things. What's that page, what's that page on Twitter? T in the park, T is for techno, or T, right? They, most of them have those names, right? They have very techno based names, but they only post videos of fucking Michael Bibby in his shades. It's interesting, isn't it? But um, I wonder, what do you reckon they play at these festivals, um, these anti lockdown, anti COVID festivals, uh, like, you know, on, on the floats? I wonder, is it kind of drum and bass? Is it jungle? Is it techno house? Like, I wonder what it is. Um, we'll find out in a bit. It says it continues here. Um, initially scheduled to run between 2 p.m. until 5. Most continued until the evening with the Amsterdam motor, motor, municipality, municipality sorry, calling for no one else to join by mid-afternoon due to the overcrowding fears. The Dutch government introduced a new restrictions in response to fears of the spread of Delta variant. Da, da, da. Currently, only one-day events with a maximum of 70, 750 visitors are allowed with attendees requiring proof of vaccination, a recent negative test result, or proof that they've recovered from the virus within the last six months honestly man there's probably more gunk in the flipping you know amsterdam water supply than than anything right and these guys are bulletproof right strong strapping people um physically imposing straight to the point very blunt um cool uh bilingual for the most part I don't know, man. If if they can handle that, I think they can handle COVID pretty easily. But I also would imagine the temperament of Dutch people, which probably makes them the worst candidates for vaccinations and shit, right? Because they would just strike me as, you know, fundamentally very skeptical people. They like to ask questions. They like to push back. Um, they're very hard headed. I would imagine in that respect. So imagine trying to get these guys to take the vaccine. It's just impossible. Especially people who operate within the nightlife. People who operate within the fringes of society. Who kind of move to the beat of their own drum, right? That kind of regard. Um, who've kind of carved their little utopia, their little scene out of the out of the blue. Just oh, spare a thought for the school, innit? See, the school probably knew what they were doing. They kind of closed down and shut up shop when everyone accused them of racism, right? Which was funny because this what's happening. What happened with the school is what they're trying to do with Grease Miller. It feels like, which it feels kind of unfair when you consider where Grease Miller is and where the school was. But you know, the less said on that, the better. But they might have been onto something because they probably wouldn't have survived anyway if they keep closing and opening. If they keep you know lifting and. Uh, putting back restrictions in terms of going to clubs and whatnot, this school probably would never have survived. But Jesus, man, 
Jesus. It continues. Oh, yeah, it is T in techno. So it shows here a little video of the protest. We can play a bit of that. <laughs> music oh, it's EDM oh it's EDM interesting isn't it they're playing okay because it's awakening people fucking I didn't know it was big EDM was big over in Holland you can tell anywhere straight away usually from the phones in the air isn't it? Um, as soon as you can count a high prevalence of phone users in the party you always know it's going to be something shitty, right? Music wise, it's just is the nature of the beast. It's not a bad thing because, you know, everyone should enjoy what they want to enjoy, but it usually is a good indicator of the terrible music taste they're going to have. Um, but yeah, what can you do? Continue. I'm US Press in Amsterdam feels like a festival on its own. More videos. What they play. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all the baked tunes and that. Uh, what there is, uh, I think we made ourselves um, heard quite quite well. Joris Vaughan is playing too. Oh, Joris Vaughan's yeah, sounding like, uh, interesting. Fair enough, man. But they're kicking off, innit? They're not having it. They really are not having it. And I don't blame them, to be honest. I just don't, you know, what is the solution? What is the solution, really? Imagine living in Holland and especially in Amsterdam specifically, not being able to go to raves and shit. It just kind of takes away the, the enjoyment of living in a city like that. Do you know what I mean? Part of the reason why that place is fun is because of the debauchery, the nightlife, all that sort of malarkey. And not having it makes that living there far less enjoyable. So I completely get it. I really, really do get it. But no one's having it, man. People are not having it. They're not standing for the bands. They want to go out there and enjoy themselves. And at this point, it just feels like, I don't know, I'm not really sure what people are waiting for or what what point we want to get to because it feels like we all have the information. Even COVID vaccine misinformation is fairly easy to debunk. You can find all the necessary resources to make your own informed decision. Either or, I don't, you know, I don't think anyone can kind of begrudge somebody if they don't want to take it. If you do want to take it, cool, you take it. If you don't, you don't. But we don't, I, I don't know what they what they want, these governments. Are they waiting to get to a point where everybody is vaccinated, everyone wants a vaccine passport? It's just not going to happen. You're not going to get the majority of the population to do it. It just isn't going to happen. It's just impossible. You can't get a majority of the population to do anything, especially nowadays with the internet. As much as people said, you know, measles, mumps, all that sort of whatever, you know, hepatitis and whatever shot you got back in the day. I think if, if those things were introduced later down the line around this era where we have social media and people googling stuff on webmd i think there would have been a lot of hesitancy around that too i just think nowadays it's just very difficult to coerce people into doing something and pretending it's for the greater good or acting like it's for the greater good when really it's to kind of you know maybe squeezing some extra governmental oversights that didn't really exist prior i don't know who knows but it just feels like a bit of a fool's errand at the moment. It feels like a bit of a waste of time. We get waste of waste of resources. More time should be put into trying to get society functioning with this cloud over our head in COVID and trying to make it work. Um, for however long we can. I just think, you know, unfortunately there are gonna be cadres along the way, but what do we wanna do? Go out, you know, into the streets wrapped up in flipping bubble wrap. It's just not gonna work that way. And I just don't see it. maybe it's just me and I'm being ignorant here, but I just don't know how a month a year and a half later how you're ever going to convince those absolute whack jobs that go and protest about not wearing a mask in a walmart to get a vax it just doesn't seem logical you know those crazies that go and storm you know local community halls and shout and rant at you know school advisory boards about their children wearing masks those people will never come on the side of science and say you know what just for or even the side of convenience like i said like you know i'm only for that stuff and passports and vaccines because of the industry that i work in or the industry that i want to work in in the future in terms of nightlife and whatnot um and entertainment industry it's just it's just gonna have to be a it's just a requirement unfortunately you know when people gathered in large areas you're just gonna have to have the passport you have to gonna have to get vaccinated you're gonna have to you're just gonna have to do it you can have to succumb if you want to operate and work in the area and that's the only reason why i agree to any of those things but if I wasn't in that field, maybe I'd be more hesitant. And if and if I wasn't, it really wouldn't be an issue. I don't think if I had, I don't know. I just, I just don't know. 
I just don't see the solution here. It just feels like a little bit of a going around in circles. And again, look how quick the Afghanistan news has kind of popped out of the current news um, rotation. You know what I mean? Suddenly other things have kind of populated it and everyone's completely forgot about flipping Afghanistan and people falling off planes as they try to escape. Typical. Typical, typical, typical. So next on the list here, we've got this interesting news courtesy of the BBC. Latitude Festival, more than 1,000 attendees test positive for COVID. <laughs> Which is funny because I'm pretty sure to get in, you had to have the vaccine passport to prove that you had the shots. So I don't know if people en masse fake the shit because I think it's probably either too fake. I'm sure it's just a QR code or it's just like a a, a form that someone can just fob. I'm pretty sure if people can... There were, there were times back in the day where I was traveling on a fake travel card or monthly oyster card or whatnot for a good while or maybe a two year stretch e everywhere i went i had some sort of fraudulent piece of travel um paraphernalia that i was using you know to get to get around these exorbitant you know flipping con laced tfl charges i was doing it all the time and again and i'm a doofus and i'm not the greatest on photoshop so imagine these kids coming up who live off memes, who are com consistently or, you know, um, yeah, consistently in front of their laptops, um, digitally native, you know, when, when, when their parents gave birth to them, the first toy they got was a flipping iPad. Imagine what they can do nowadays. So it's just funny headline. You know I mean, for a festival that you had to go in with a COVID passport, 1,000 people are <laughs> test positive for COVID. It's just hilarious. Um, it continues to say more than 1,000 Latitude Festival attendees later tested um, for positive for COVID according to government figures. One of the government COVID um, test events, ouch, um, about 37,000 visitors were at the venue daily from the 21st to the 24th of July. All festival goers needed to be fully vaccinated or test negative, but findings showed 432 people were probably infectious at the time. So they had to go in there either fully vaxxed or test negative. Now, don't get me wrong. The negative test, I'm assuming, was probably a lateral test, which is not as great as the PCR ones you have to buy um, or you have to get administered to you. So, fair. But still, that is a high number of people testing positive. That goes to show just how impossible it is to put this virus back in a bottle, isn't it? It's just impossible to get it under any semblance of control. You look at Australia and New Zealand, places that are land, no, not land, not places, you know, islands essentially, where they can close their borders a lot more effectively than we can here in Europe. And they're still having to lock down, even though, you know, they're locking down off the back of flipping, you know, single digit deaths and whatnot, or double digit deaths. Still, they can't handle it. They can't put it, they can't get it under control. And if they can't, with all their, you know, with, with their high levels of compliance, people are only really kicking off now, it feels like in the news. You didn't really see most people moaning before. They were kind of lauding that New Zealand Prime Minister lady, I forgot her name, as a really great leader. She was doing great things, being really clear in her instructions and whatnot and views and blah, blah, blah. And now, obviously, stuff has changed because people have just got tired. And at the end, I think people were advising this before, right? Do you remember in the beginning, people were saying, or scientists specifically, health professionals, even some sociologists saying it's just impossible to get people to be compliant with lockdowns and stuff forever it's just never going to work people are going to get tired of it they're going to get bored they're going to want to live their lives regardless they're going to want to take the risk so the best thing to do is just to make sure everyone gets vaxxed up as quickly as possible before their willpower breaks and that's what we kind of did but still that feels like it's not enough and it's like this is proof of it this is a open air festival right they all they told us you don't really need to wear a mask in these sort of situations so I imagine a lot of people there probably didn't wear masks it's pretty difficult to social distance in the festival. It's nigh on impossible. Even if you try and sit in little islands and whatnot, it's just not going to happen. You're sharing cubicles. You're sharing, par you know, straws to drink out of, of course. Like, it's impossible. How is you going to, like, it's just, uh, I don't know. It says, continues here, it says, Stuart Kibble, director of Suffolk Public Health, said COVID was still circulating in this country. Figures from seven days up to, and including 24th of August, show Suffolk had a rate of 241 coronavirus cases per 100,000. So they're trying to basically justify and say, you know, that area where that festival was at was already surging before they put the festival on. Well, if that was true, cancel the festival. You know what I mean? These, again, 
excuses after the fact. The Music and Arts Festival in Henman Park near Southwood was the first event of its kind after the realization of lockdown rules. Music headliners included the Bastille, uh, Bombay Bicycle Club, Legendary, Wolf Alice and the Chemical Brothers, of course. Oh, bliss. It's the Suffolk County Council said on 1,050 people who tested positive for COVID in the last days of latitude and 175 lived in Suffolk. Government figures show 619 people caught coronavirus around the world. Sorry, around the time of the event. Mr. Kimball said as Suffolk reopens once again, people attend busy events or attractions. It's, impossible. it's important so that people continue to be considerate of others and wear a mask to keep their distance where appropriate. He added, while he, the majority of people were fully vaccinated, we cannot be sure that those people around us won't become very unwell if they catch it. Coach Secretary Oliver Doden said the government's test events showed we can reintroduce mass sports and cultural events safely, but it's important that people remain cautious when mixing the very crowded settings. I just want to know about this number i just want to know whether or not people were fobbing to get in because like i said in here says an article all festival goers needed to be fully vexed or test negative but findings show 432 people were probably infectious so these people were all asymptomatic allegedly right and then all these people were fully vexed double jabbed probably because you know um you just assume so or well, at least one so they've got what up to 50 percent coverage still better than nothing and they all tested negative, even if it's a lateral or PCR, lateral teflotis are what you need to go into the nightclub. So this just seems insane. Legitimately one of the most insane things I've seen in a long time. I don't, I don't know what this what this mean, what this basically means if you're honest about it, is that all these precautions don't do shit. And I think deep down we all knew. At most, wearing a mask and trying to be as high, you know hygienic as you can is going to make the biggest difference. But all these other things in terms of living your life and trying to be COVID safe, it's just impossible. You either tell people to be careful and if they're ill, just stay at home or you just lock everything up. There is no way of making it COVID safe in a festival. It's just impossible. Just hear how that dumb that sounds in the same sentence. COVID safe and the festival is like, eh? what does that even mean? And this is a good reflection of that. But again, what do I know? What do I know? Let's continue. What else we got here? Slow tire to cancel the event and happy festival. So that's sad for him. I'm sure he's going to be upset. Oh yeah, this is a good one, isn't it? Interesting point. So this Kershaw Mix Mag is a flipping mad article. It says the following exclusive Pretty Patel used an incorrect data about illegal rapes to justify emergency powers for the police. And um, this was obviously during the height of COVID, the height of lockdowns. People were basically itching in their seats, wanting to let off some steam. There was loads of, I don't know, what do you call them? Anarchists, neopunks, and people that live in squats that are basically turning their places into bastions of freedom and allowing people to rave and put in sound systems and essentially put a middle finger up to the British government. Boris and you know his Tory party were absolutely fumbling all over the place with their COVID response. Things are just all over the place, isn't it? And it felt like these sort of like you know illegal raves were a natural reaction to how chaotic and uncertain everything was around people. It wasn't like a plague rave. It was essentially more like a, won't say a protest rave. It it was a basically a reaction to the disorder going on and to the impending sense of doom that everyone felt. They were like, you know what? Until these guys figure it out. We're going to be fucked after the case, right? That's what people basically thought. So I thought, you know what? Let's just enjoy ourselves while we can because we know once Boris figures it out, we're probably going to have suffered the consequences and be under a long lockdown, which we effectively were. So in this article, it says, an investigation by Mixed Mag has found that the Met was using flawed methodology to calculate the number of raves that it was responding to during lockdown, which had the potential to dramatically inflate its statistics, of course, which then effectively led to more draconian rules for you and I to go outdoors. Pretty Patel used inc the article says the follows. Pretty Patel used inc inc accurate. Why, why can't I read that loud? Pretty Patel used incorrect data about illegal raids provided by the Met Police to justify emergency powers for police forces during the first wave of COVID nineteen pandemic. Max Mac can reveal. Introducing new powers for the police in an article for the Telegraph on August the twenty eighth, twenty twenty, the Home Secretary said in London alone the Metropolitan has the Metropolitan Police has responded to more than one thousand unlicensed events, such as big raves and parties, since the end of June, receiving information on more than twenty two hundred events across the city. We will not allow this breathtakingly selfish behaviour from a census manner to jeopardize the progress we have made. Um this is why we're cracking down on the most serious 
bre uh, breaches of social distancing restrictions. You know, if you live in London, that that is obviously cap because even your most, you know, free loving, everyone come around my house friend that you have in your social group doesn't throw as many house drivers as they used to in the past. The idea that people are throwing all these random events all over the place, more than a thousand, is just insane, especially in London. It's just not going to happen. Um, it's just not going to happen. It really is, especially during a global lockdown. People are really afraid here in the UK. People are fobbing people in. It just didn't seem like a like a believable number but you know mixed mag can kind of uh continue here it says an investigation by mixed mag has found that during this time the met police was using a flawed methodology information obtained under the freedom of information act has revealed that the figures published were actually in a number of messages about illegal raves recorded on this computer aided dispatch system rather than the number of confirmed license events i would like to know what a cda or a cad is for for me because in, back in my day when I was in uni, C, CAD or SCAD meant computer assisted design. But this is computer aided dispatch. So, what is this? Their way of hacking into your WhatsApp and your iMessage and your Telegram. That's scary. But imagine they were racking up all the messages people were throwing out there, looking for raves, looking for parties as the parties themselves. Cunts. Says so this means that Met could have counted individual events dozens or even hundreds of times in numbers it published, as well as including incidents that were actually not actually raves. A separate CAD message is created every time the police are contacted for informed, uh, contacted and informed of a crime. So more than 50 people report the same illegal rave. The system creates more than 50 CAD messages for a single event, thus making it seem like everybody in the country is raving. Oh, she's got nice boots on there. Um, it continues here, it says on August 18th, in an email statement to Mix Mike the Met issued an apology for confusion over the statistics but used by the Home Secretary. It said the figures used, um, she used related to a number of pieces of information about the events in the capital received by the police forces and not the number of events identified. Oh my God, they even admitted it. The Met declined to provide a breakdown of what would reveal the true number of illegal identified by during this period. Speaking to Mix Mike under the condition of anonymity, the former police officer told the Mix Mike, it's common for a single rave to generate a large number of CAD messages as many different people call the police to separately to report the event. The Met doesn't regularly publish the numbers of a separate calls that it received individual and license event. But on July the 19th, the Met revealed that it received more than 30 calls about a single party that took place in North London. This incident has been doubled, um, has double counted more than 30 times as this quoted by the Home Secretary. So they, oh yeah, I don't know, man. What can you say about this Tory government? But then this leads me again to this article that I remember reading back in the day, courtesy of Sky News, which basically explains the reason why raves died in the, what, late 80s, or 80s, right? Around the 80s, early 90s, why it effectively died. And it was because, <laughs> this is an article, the headline says, the real reason why Thatcher tried to ban acid house parties revealed. It says, Margaret Thatcher tried to stop the new fashion of acid rave party. She didn't try, she succeeded. Um, after an all-night event, rave shattered the tranquility of a Tory MP's uncle's newly furnished, of, uh, um, newly released, sorry, officials paper show. Why can't I read that? My reading a little bit is terrible. It says, the Prime Minister asked to be briefed on what powers the police had to control parties and months after legislation was introduced to tackle their licence gathering. However, she was warned by then Scotland um, Mint Secretary Malcolm Rifkin that proposal law should not be uh, should not affect the innocent events such as barn dances miss thatcher was alerted to the burgeoning rave culture after a party held in bentley in hampshire in august 1989 she was personally alerted right margaret thatcher was told about these raves archie hamilton mp of epson and elware forwarded the prime minister a letter from his uncle gerald coke who said funny enough his first surname is coke who said he was very disturbed by the party which was lasted until 7 30 a.m mr coke a former magistrate said that there was a feeling of collective anger and helplessness that police could not do nothing because there was a private party in a handwritten note on the letter mr thatcher um, was asked if the Home Office should provide a briefing on what powers police had to control these gatherings. She replied, yes, if this is a new fashion, we must be prepared for it and preferably prevent such things from starting. <laughs> Look at these guys. So this is what, what, what we're fighting against, right? This is what the Tory government's built on. Margaret Thatcher saying, yes, if these acid house raves or these acid raves or these raves in general in open fields that are inviting people from all walks of life to celebrate and enjoy themselves free of any of the social constraints. If these things are the new fashion, we must be prepared 
to pummel it to the ground and prevent such things from starting. They don't even want to get it to get headway. This is why you know these guys are out here trying to ruin your fun because when you go to a legal rave, usually, for the most part, it usually ends really early or it ends really late in terms of police stopping you. It's never in the middle. You don't really go to a house party or rave and in the middle is when it gets locked up. It's usually really early, just as you start or just as you're about to finish anyway. The someone comes in. It's always like that and that's because they're on the job. These guys are on job. They want to come and ruin your fun and they'll do it happily. And this is a key indication of it. Insane in the article. I remember reading this back in the day thinking, oh my God, this explains everything about the UK, why we're so anti-fun. And definitely explains this insane article where they're essentially fobbing the statistics in order to it to fit flipping um, Pretty Patel's uh, agenda. This And this is the girl that Skepta's in love with. <laughs> that guy, I love him, but... He is on a mad one with that one. But yeah, what can you do? Let's move on. What else do we have here? We got that. We got this. What time? How much time have I used up already? Have I used up a lot? I think so, haven't I? Oh, yeah, we're pushing 59. So let's maybe do one more and then we can jet. Yep, it says here Coast Coast of Sky Sports News. It looks like Harry Kane is staying at Tottenham. After all that posturing and moaning and crying on TV and getting, you know, Gary Neville to do a flipping or a walk and talk or, you know, talk and walk and talk, talk and walk or whatever, interview with him on Sky Sports, it looks like Danny Levy has won and Harry Kane is not going anywhere this summer, at least. Um, it's headline coach of Sky Sports, Harry Kane announces he is to stay at Tottenham this summer after third Man City bids. I love how he's trying to say he's staying as opposed to Tottenham aren't letting him go. But hey, you got to do what you got to do in your brand. Um, we continue, we scroll down. It says Harry Kane has announced he will stay at Tottenham this summer after a move to Manchester City failed to materialise. Kane, who has three years left on his Spurs deal, had asked to leave the club this summer in search of silverware, but appears to have softened his stance following the long summer of negotiations between City and Tottenham chairman Daniel Levy. In a post on Twitter, he said the following, you see the post of him. Um, it was incredible to see the reception from the Spurs fan on Sunday and to read some of the messages of support I've had in the last few weeks. I'll be staying at Tottenham this summer and will be 100% focused on helping the team achieve the success. He did say this summer, um, the transfer window reopens in January, so there is a possibility that City could come in from then. But considering how, how unlikely it is for big teams to do such big deals in January, most likely City will move on and sign somebody else or either wait for Haaland to come available next season way for Mbappe or maybe or maybe just go for Lewandowski now because he's already you know given um, the bat signal for wanting a new challenge and for Bayern Munich that might seem like a sensible solution because he's not going to go to one of their rivals in the Bundesliga um, out of sight out of mind of course you might come back to terrorize him in the Champions League but for the most part that makes more sense and it's quite a sobering if not depressive place to be if you're Harry Kane because essentially his dream of winning silverware at another big club is slowly but surely fading away and it isn't because of his talent, because if Mbappe Haaland didn't, weren't around, he would still be the number one striker. He would be the number one striker um, available on the market at the moment. But considering Mbappe's and Haaland's profile and their ages, it just seems like better business and a more of a shrewd way of doing stuff to try and get those guys in your team and kind of build your team around them and have them be the next sort of like you know cult icons or stars um hopefully try and get them to believe in your project get a manager a sporting director in that could do the job and then try and collect trophies for however long those guys stay at your club that's probably the best way to do things right um Mbappe's in his early 20s Haaland's still in his mid I think or just uh, maybe younger than that so they're far younger than and then Kane they offer a lot more on the pitch and it looks like as the years progress, Kane's ability to tr attract those big clubs is going to dwindle because of his injury record, because of his age, because of the way he plays. It's just it's just an unfortunate situation. But in general, it's more so unfortunate because he had plenty of chances to leave the club, um, especially at his peak or during the height of his time, maybe in 2018 when he signed that contract extension. And it felt like he was just really comfortable. He was comfortable playing in the Premier League. He wasn't being that ambitious, which was okay. I just did think a lot of people were basically placing a lot of their hopes and dreams on Kane or were basically more 
I, I felt like the fans wanted him to move and try and win trophies because they loved him so much more than he wanted himself. He didn't really feel like he was ever pushing to try and win the league with another team to try and win Champions League. He was just happy to, you know, be a, effectively a big fish in a small pond, which is the, which is the bad thing because he earns an amazing wage as the captain of the team. He's the captain of England, right? Is he captain of England or is it Harry, or Harry Maguire? It doesn't matter. But regardless, you know what I mean. Um, it's worked out pretty well for him. But from a silverware point of view, it's getting harder and harder to see where that's going to happen or how it's going to happen. Unless maybe he goes to like an Italian team. You know, you can maybe could you switch pitch him in an Inter, in a Juve maybe in the future. Um, that could be a good way to get yourself a, guarantee yourself a league title and a couple of trophies, domestic ones. I don't really know. But this is definitely proof that if ever there was any doubt that Daniel Levy is the toughest chairman to deal with in football or the toughest person to deal with in football full stop maybe um only second to Mino Raiola this is it he did not budge because he knew in it 150 million for Tottenham is doesn't mean anything it doesn't do much it doesn't move the needle how many good players can they buy for 150 how many good players do that that they want can they get for 150 especially now so late in the window it's not going to happen so there's no point in losing somebody that's going to guarantee you 20 plus goals per season um, just so you can get the money to buy other players, which you're not guaranteed to even get when you get the money. And everyone knows you have the money, so they're going to try and overcharge you for players who aren't worth the money that they're putting on them. It's just, yeah, it's just shit show all around. But it's just hilarious to see how all of those tactics, just from a main night point of view, didn't work. And now he's having to come back with his tail tucked in between the legs and pretend like the fans love him, which they probably do with Spurs because, you know, it's Spurs. They don't really have much to cheer for, really. They're, never, they're probably not going to finish in the top four ever again. Um, so, yeah, and he they've got a one truly world-class player in their ranks. Of course, they're going to welcome him back on the pitch and be happy he's staying, of course. It continues, it says, um, Kane, who has been a target for City all summer, came off the bench on Saturday's 1-0 win um, in his first appearance since returning for late for pre-season, where he went on strike and didn't turn up for training. The England captain, Doe, remains adamant he was always scheduled to come back later. Spurs value Kane upward of £120 million, but were keen to keep the striker despite believing he had a gentleman's agreement with Levy to leave the club this summer. Um, City made an offer of €100 million Euros for Kane at the start of June, but were unable to come close to the agreement with Spurs. To be fair, it's quite a, it's quite insane to think that you can offer €100 million for Grealish and then only €100 million for Kane, especially consider Harry Kane's CV and his track record in the league. That is obviously way off the mark. If I was Tottenham, I would hold that for 200 M's. Fuck it. He's guaranteeing you 20 goals, even though he misses, what, two months of the season or, or maybe even a month. Let's, let's be fair to him. Harry Kane always misses one month of the season, all the time. So, you know, 200 million is light work for Kane. You know, 20, especially if you're Man City. He might fire you to another league title, bonuses and all that guaranteed. He might fire you to another FA Cup win. He might fire you to getting as close as possible to winning a Champions League. It's a really no-brainer in all intents and purposes. But, you know, Man City like to pretend that they're a scrappy, small startup club that can't spend money and shit. So that's probably why they didn't want to splash a 200 M's because that would really reveal their financial power that we all know they have. But yeah, um, unlucky Harry Kane, you know, Stanley Levy 2, Harry Kane 0. Um, he wasn't able to escape the clutches of Levy and now he's having to pretend like he always wanted to stay at Tottenham even though he purposely tried to leave. And then lastly, we've got this confusing news that has just really been bothering me in all the ways sense and purposes because it really doesn't make any sense um from a kind of sporting sense of the yeah it, it doesn't make any sense from the player's point of view or as, as a player and it also doesn't make sense from like a sporting glory trophy hunting sort of way it doesn't really make sense this is the news Kylian Mbappe Paris Saint-Germain reject 137 million bid from Real Madrid for the France forward Kylian Mbappe's contract with the Parc des Prince runs until summer 2022 and the France international has so far refused to sign an extension on his current deal. The 22-year-old has been linked with a move to the Bernabeu throughout the summer. So, he's obviously rejected a new contract. There's been mutterings, especially from the Transfer Window podcast, uh, Big Up Duncan Castle and their man. They've been speaking about this from time, saying that Mbappe's been speaking to his advisor, speaking to his team, and he's very methodical and very clear about how he sees his career progressing. He wants to be strategic about his moves and not just go willy-nilly in places. He's not driven by money, but driven by carving a legacy and you know creating moments, winning trophies and whatnot and being remembered as one of the greats. And he wants to do that in a clear, methodical way. 
and I think he identified a few clubs that he thinks would be a great fit for him, you know, getting to the next level. I think he was thinking about Liverpool, Real Madrid, um, uh, May United and somewhere else. There's a few other clubs I think he was thinking about. But in general, the in, what was being intimated was that regardless of who PSG signed, he wants to leave. And then when a Messi signed, I was get, I got the impression from the pictures that he uploaded and how he was generally carrying himself and the lack of media around him, Neymar and Mbappe playing up front potentially, it kind of felt like people behind the scene that PSG knew also that Mbappe wanted to leave. So they weren't trying to put too much of that content out front and center. They were just mainly pushing the Di Maria, Neymar and Messi thing and not really the Mbappe thing, which you know gave you an indication he reached the contract. And now we're at a point where he clearly has asked PSG he wants to leave. He doesn't want to sign a new contract. And now he wants to go this summer and Real Madrid are offering money to take him this summer. And it's just, to me, I feel like, what's the point of going if you're Mbappe? Why go now? Why not just ride out this year, hang out with Messi and, and Sergio Ramos, um, play fantastic, exhilarating football in Ligue 1, score some crazy goals, put up some numbers, um, stat pad, um, whatever it may be, have another run at the Champions League. Who knows? Messi's not guaranteeing winning the Champions League, but he would increase your chances. You'd hope so, especially alongside a focused Neymar. You know, the best version of Neymar I feel like we saw at Barcelona was playing alongside Messi. Um, that might be possible. Why not? Why not try that just for the year, and then you get to go to any club you want to next season? Because Real Madrid, the law of Real Madrid, obviously, is really there because they're a legendary club. You want to be part of the Galacticos, that jersey, the history. Of course, we get it. But Real Madrid aren't Real Madrid of old and also I don't really see or I don't really envis in envision envision a time where next season somehow Real Madrid won't want to get Mbappe because the theory out there is that allegedly they want to sign Haaland and Mbappe they want to restart the Galactico hype train and sign two of the biggest stars in football right now back to back and I'll be amazing to see them both in one team but then the other feeling that I get from this is that Mbappe clearly doesn't want to be a bit he doesn't want to be one of the kind of accompanying players in a team he wants to be the main guy he doesn't want to be in a team like i think it was already a lot for him to play next to neymar and you know how much attention he kind of absorbs he wants to kind of for his brand probably wants to stand alone at the club and be the talisman right and maybe going to Real madrid now the considering they've gone old and aging team um, they don't have really many standout Galacticos. A lot of the players there who they signed in the hopes of being Galacticos are kind of washed up. It makes a lot of sense for him to go there, but I just don't think now is the time. If he was trying to push to go to Liverpool now, it would make more sense because effectively he could maybe be the final piece to Jigsaw that needs them to try and reclaim the Premier League title. It could maybe again get them to get near to winning the Champions League again. Like, that could be a good um, opportunity if you went to Liverpool. For sure, I could see that happening. But going to Real Madrid right now just seems so short-sighted. I don't know. It feels as if, like, he's so desperate to leave and not have his name associated with the Neymar Messi um, contingent and legacy has been drummed up this season. It doesn't make any sense. I don't know. I'd want, I'd want, to, have, I'd want to see a year of myself playing alongside those guys. But maybe there's stuff that happened behind the scenes that just affects his decision and he wants to leave off the back of that. But it just doesn't seem that way. He doesn't necessarily admit that or kind of float the idea out there. I don't know. It's just interesting. Interesting, interesting point that we're in at the moment. And this is all coming from Real Madrid, the team that said they didn't have any money. And all of a sudden they're offering 137 M's for Mbappe. These teams, man. These teams. Anyway, that's the Exxon Zing Show episode number 487. Thanks so much for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have your company. Or oh, 488, sorry, 488. If it's your first time tuning in the show via YouTube, please make sure you smash the like and subscribe. Leave me a comment down below. And of course, if you're listening, yeah, yeah. And of course, if you're listening to the podcast, please leave me a five star review and share with your friends. And I'll see you guys again very, very soon. For now, take care. Oops, let's move that. I didn't move the camera too much there. Whoopsie daisy. <laughs> For now, take care and be safe. Peace.